Okay, so with that announcement, let me now turn to uh, some questions. Who's going to go first? Uh, if we could have the gentleman at the front, um, at the very front on the left-hand side, in the gray suit, if you could identify yourself. No, no, to the walls the front, there he is, yep. Uh, if you could identify yourself, please, sir, for the audience. Joseph Tufour from University of Professional Studies, uh, Ghana. Uh, to Professor um, Sanjeev, um, in one of the uh, slides I saw um, that on the implementation of the fiscal strategy side for the three different categories of uh, countries that you use, it looks as if the implementation stage uh, they all score the same, but on the other two, that is the understanding stage and then the formulation stages, uh, uh, there seem to be some wide differences uh, among the countries. Why, why is that the case uh, from, the, from the analysis? Why is that the, at the implementation stage, uh, the different countries are almost performing the same way, but wide differences in other sectors? Uh, the second uh, point is that I also noticed that in, the, uh, in terms of accommodating the business cycles into the processes, um, for low-income countries, there was zero. Um, why does it mean that that is totally ignored in the in the um, processes or not? And then, um, do, do you have a final question, okay. Joseph? Okay. And yeah, then the the, the, the last others. one goes to Professor Juka. Um, in terms of the tax system in developing countries, particularly from where I come from, you have a large number of the informal sector. How how how? To what extent can this category of businesses be incorporated into the tax system vis-a-vis uh, -vis the former sector, which is probably bearing the larger portion of the, the tax uh, uh, revenue that is to be generated? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joseph. So we also have a question on this side. Could you pass the microphone to Omar? Omar, if you put your hand up. There we are. Thank you, and identify yourself for those who don't know you. Okay, thanks. Omar McDoom from the London School of Economics. Thank you very much to all the speakers. A question for Yuka. Yuka, I'm very grateful that you're here because it allows me to ask a question I've been wanting to ask for a very, very long time about the Nordic miracle. So you've asked the question, well, what features of the tax system explain the Nordic success? Well, I wanted to know if, in fact, it had something to do, had nothing, in fact, to do with the tax system of Nordic countries and had something to do outside of the tax systems. And the explanation that I've often heard, and I wanted to know what you thought about this as a Finn, is that it had something to do with Nordic countries' demography. And in particular, the two facts, that they are both very small populations, and also they're relatively homogeneous populations. Diversity is correlated, we believe, with different notions of what the state is. And so it may be that individuals are unwilling to pay taxes to a state that they don't, whose authority they may not share or have respect for. Um, so I wondered then, then what about this idea about homogeneity and about state size and about population size, whether it has something to do with the success of their tax system. Okay, thank you, Omar. Is there another question on that side of the room before we go to the other side of the room? Uh, okay, we have two, sorry, Michael at the back there. You're just by Michael Wilcock. Sorry, if you could say who you are, Michael, for those who don't know you. <laughs> yeah, I'm Michael. Um, no, I'm Michael Wilcock from the World Bank. I guess it's just a refinement of the first question, actually, and, uh, to Sanjeev. In this, I think it was budget unity out of the 12 different things in your, uh, in your spider diagram there. Uh, in one sense, one would expect uh, high income, middle income, and low income to be sort of arrayed as you would expect them to be on a diagram like that. So particular, not just in the category of implementation, but the specific question around budget unity. Why is it that for all in statistical purposes, at least, we don't seem to see any difference at all between those three. That, and I, I can think of an explanation, but I, I'd uh, be really interested in how the IMF sort of reckon, you know, make, make sense of that kind of empirical result. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Michael. We have two ladies at the front, and then I'm gonna switch over to the right-hand side. So the, the lady, could you identify yourself, please? Okay, I'm Medina Globa with the Economic Police Research Center in Uganda. Uh, mine goes to, um, to Sanjay, uh, I saw your, your line up on the budgeting process. You kind of just finished reading the budget and it seemed a little bit desperate. Uh, we're wondering how 
the IMF comes into, or the donors, come into influencing this budget process. Because right now it's a bit too political than actually the Ministry of Financing taking its role in the budget process. So how does the donors, like the Britain Woods, infecting on our budgeting process? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Medina. If you could pass the microphone to the lady uh, on the same row. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for three presentation. Very exciting. And uh, uh, my questions uh, would like to ask. Uh, Could you uh, identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Hong from Central Institute for Economic Management. Um, my question uh, addressed to Sancho about uh, your very interesting uh, diagram or diamond diagram. Um, uh, you, you said that uh, there must be kind of macroeconomic um, fiscal uh, forecasting and also fiscal risk management uh, activities. Uh, and also uh, you said that uh, the fiscal uh, system should uh, be independent. So uh, my question is about uh, the how uh, the institutional arrangement, I uh, meaning the organizational arrangement, uh, uh, arrangement uh, can be met uh, with the uh, those kind of uh, the indicators, uh, whether uh, the, the 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 first two indicators should uh, uh, should take a role by the uh, the the uh, independent agencies or the Ministry of Finance, because uh, in the case of Vietnam, for uh, for example, it seems that uh, those three uh, role are all take by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, even including the tax uh, um, uh, taxation uh, management. So uh, my question is about uh, what about the international experience about those uh, kind of functions? Thank okay, you. Thank you very much, Hong. Okay, uh, do we have questions on the right-hand side? Uh, I hope there's a question also for Vladimir among the group. Uh, please, the gentleman at the front, if you could identify yourself. Thank you. Yes, I'm Santiago Levy from the Inter-American Development Bank. This is a comment on, on, on the second presentation by, by Juca, which I find really interesting and very important, and I take advantage of Sanji's presence here. Um, I think a lot of the revenue and tax analysis in developing countries, unfortunately, only looks at the revenue side and tries to find the weight, the dead weight losses or the efficiency or inefficiency losses, and there's a lot of concentration on the mix of VAT, income taxes, and the structure of taxation. You make the very important point that the tax base and the incentives to evade are not independent of what the money is used for and the expenditure side. And the Nordic example tells that the participation rate can in itself be endogenous and compensate some of the labor market distortions if you actually spend on that. I want to just suggest that this analysis be extended because in many developing countries the revenue side of the budget undermines the tax base and undermines the revenue effort and actually ends up subsidizing innovation because a lot of the spending goes to subsidize informal activities directly and indirectly, which not only hurts the participation rate but hurts formal and informal choices and hurts firm behavior. So, so more broadly, and I finish the point here, uh, this idea of not only looking only at the revenue side of the budget but simultaneously looking at what the money is being spent on and the incentives that it generates to evade or not to evade and to participate and not to participate is sort of fundamental in the way we think about tax systems. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago, and, and welcome to um, Hanoi. Uh, there's a question uh, in the middle there. The lady uh, with her hand up, please. I guess most of the questions I had have been addressed, but perhaps let me just say, I had a, oh, let me introduce myself. My name is Pamela from Zambia Institute for Policy Analysis and Research. And I think uh, my question is uh, on uh, the uh, pro pro production of financial statistics by an independent office. I think I would love to hear more of how that can be achieved uh, with some examples where that has been achieved. And uh, my second question uh, is linked to how I mean, uh, linking how expenditure, uh, linking expenditure to how it is collected now vis-a-vis -a, -vis a large or sizable informal sector, how can that be achieved as well? Because in some of these countries, the informal sector is quite large. So how could government spend uh, expenditure be linked to how the revenue is collected? And the other last point is on third party reporting. Of course, given the same size of the informal sector, how can third-party reporting be enhanced? 
Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, uh, Pamela. Are there any questions on that side? Uh, Alan, please, could you pass the microphone to the gentleman at the front? And then I'll switch back. Um, Alan de Genvry, University of California at Berkeley. Seems to me that all three presentations make the point that they need, there is a need to coordinate, there is a need to plan, in a sense, there is a need to return to a capacity to think ahead, to define an industrial policy, to link the income side to the expenditure side. This puts the back on the table, in a sense, the issue of planning, an issue that we have kind of swept aside. Planning has been done more through the back door than in an ex explicit fashion. Could you, the three speakers, take on the issue of the institutions? How would you put planning back on the table, and what kind of institution would you use for that purpose, which in some way rejoins the uh, question from Vietnam? Okay, thank you, Alan. That's um, a question for all three members, but very much, I think, for Vladimir. Okay, so we have finally, I think, Anthony. Anthony, can you raise your hand right up so the microphone can get to you? The lady is uh, with the microphone is going to need some lunch because she's having to run thank around. Thank you very much. My name is Anthony from University of Southern Denmark in Denmark. Two questions for, actually one embedded, two embedded in one for Professor Juka. How sustainable is the Nordic model in terms of the, if you picture the demographic transition that the, these countries are going through right now, uh, the, the aging is, it has been a, a sort of a concern in the policy cycles. So this tax system, how sustainable it is because it's the huge base of this tax system depends on workforce, people are going back to work. And in that case, then, what are the lessons developing countries can learn from these uh, uh, potential sustainability issues? And then uh, two questions to Professor Vladmil. Uh, one is on an industrial policy. You argue that uh, industrial policy seems to be a way out for e sort of uh, pushing economic growth. But I want you to, to know your views on uh, to what extent that is uh, realistic in terms of the global political landscape uh, and I can give an example here. Think of the WTO and the rules of the game. What lessons can uh, developing countries draw from these and how then, how best can they go about uh, issues like uh, intellectual property rights, on, on innovation and so on and so forth, to be able to benefit more on these industrial policies? And the second question is, you argue that uh, uh, it's more, uh, these transition economics, it has something to do with government failure than uh, market failure. And I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that uh, how can this be realistic on developing countries, particularly in Africa? How is this government failure vis-a-vis -vis market failure realistic in, if you picture the African economies? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. Okay, so I'm now going to return to the panel. But before I do that, I'm, Sanjeev has a question for, I think, Yuka. Yeah, um, because uh, I'm sorry to... Uh, no, please uh, to go ahead. I want to pick up on some of the issues with Santiago raised, and uh, uh, and of course the issues that uh, Yuka addressed are the ones are bread and butter of uh, the work that we do in in the fiscal affairs department. Um, it, you know, I mean, uh, we have been looking at the design of tax systems in the context of the debate which is going on on income distribution and fiscal policy. Um, and also of the link between spending and, and, the, and the taxation, I think that is a point which is very well taken. But the ability of the governments to spend depends on the administrative capacity, which is lacking in a number of countries. So you, I mean, this model applies only if you assume that the countries have the capacity to implement good expenditure programs. And for most of us who have been in this business for a while, this is not that easy. So I think that's one link that we must recognize. Uh, the second one is dual income taxation. Uh, I think theoretically it makes sense. Uh, we, we've been discussing this with some countries. Uh, but again, in the context of the debate which has been initiated by Piketty uh, and by others, where we say that uh, labor income will be taxed at a higher rate than the capital income, how do you sell this? to a society uh, in, 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 a, in a number of places where, uh, you know, how progressive is this system going to be uh, in the end? So that's, again, an issue which we should not overlook. And again, on the self-reporting, I think that's a good idea. But let me give you a practical example. 
Uh, VAT, uh, yes, there is a self-reporting there. But one of the biggest issues we face now, for example, in Africa, is that countries are not giving VAT refunds. And so the self-reporting system breaks down. So, so we have to take into account, again, the discussion we had in the morning about what, is, what are the norms and what are the systems prevailing in the countries. And, um, and then um, I will also like to, uh, on the presentation on the investment uh, and, and then state, et cetera. I think one issue which we have to bear in mind, there's no discussion about quality of investment. Uh, we know from our experience, uh, and there's a lot of work we are doing now uh, in our own department uh, on investment because there's a huge debate of increasing invest public investment, not only in low-income countries, but in advanced countries, in emerging markets, and, and other groups of countries. But one thing that worries everybody, even in advanced countries, is how to ensure quality of investment. And to just to say that investment, if you increase investment, things will happen. Uh, we know many examples from failed projects in the history that that doesn't happen. So I just okay. wanted to add that. OK, well, we'll come back to you, uh, <clears throat> Sanjeev, uh, to respond to some of the audience. But let me take now Yuka and um, his responses because uh, there's an immediate sort of follow-up there with Sanjeev and also to the audience questions, Yuka. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you all for these excellent questions. I, I need to say that these were really great questions, uh, but they, many of them are really also really hard. So uh, let me try to do my best in, in answering them. And I, I wish I had the, the correct answer to, to, to all of these. And then uh, I, I think the world would be a better place if the economists could, could answer those. But there are still so many open issues that these are... Just uh, some some quick reflec reflections. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, that too. Yes. <laughs> uh, first of all, the point about the informal sector. Yes, that's um, that's a point well taken, and 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 this is something uh, which is uh, which actually requires thorough analysis, uh, because part of the informal sector represents uh, activities which we wouldn't like to tax at all. So it, it's in, in a sense it's good to have informal sector. For, for very poor workers, so that those we wouldn't have to, wouldn't want to tax even if we, we, we were able to. Um, then, uh, but then there, there might be some ways of utilizing new information technology, and 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 and, and the VAT chains. Although, um, as as Sanju said, the VAT is, is is something which is maybe sometimes overplayed its role. But it, there, on the other hand, there is some evidence that the adoption of VAT is this is based on, on IMF research as well. Uh, uh, adoption VAT, sort of things equal, has led to increase in tax revenues. So there's something in that which actually uh, is, is a form of, of, of a tax uh, which, is a, which, which is a kind of money machine, as, as, as your colleague at the, at, at the, at the fund, Michael Keane, puts it. Uh, maybe the, this practice of reverse charging in the in the in the VAT. So normally the VAT works so that the uh, that, that the uh, taxpayer only pays the as the as the, as the name as, as also says uh, the tax on the on the only only the value added. But in some sectors in developed countries nowadays, um, uh, uh, the uh, like like the construction sector, uh, the the final delivery or, uh, or th that firm is also responsible for the for paying back all the tax in the, on the whole chain. So that has helped to gain some extra revenues. Um, then there was a, do I carry on or leave the others? Very briefly. Oh, there were so many questions. So, I, so the one thing which is a very general question by Omar on, the, on, 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 on if, if there's anything we can learn from the Nordic tax system given that the, that the countries might be so different. And I think that this is, this is partially true that the countries are indeed different, and not, uh, not everything is exportable. But there are some features in the tax system. This is something which is very, very well dealt with in the in the in the, in the Kleben paper that the that, that there's evidence not only from the Nordic countries but but also from other countries that these features like the third-party reporting, and and the broad tax base. Uh, plus the idea of, of, of also paying attention to the expenditure side, are something which are not unique to, to the Nordic countries, although Nordic countries apply them to a large extent. 
So, so, so there's something there. Um, there might be something else as well, which, which, is, which is not, uh, not relevant, but, uh, but, but the answer is that part of it is, is, is relevant. Okay, thank you very much, Yuka. Let me next take um, Vladimir. And um, I think uh, Alan's question very much uh, <coughs> was geared at you, Vladimir. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. And uh, uh, the Alain de Genry question was about what kind of institutions you develop in order to make sure that the government works. Uh, something tangible I can say on the issue, uh, basically no one knows, right? But something tangible I can say is that if we look at the indicators of the government performance, it's better to use not the uh, indices, various indices like control over corruption, there are six indices of the World Bank, uh, uh, about uh, the government effectiveness, rule of law, and so on. These indices, uh, they are uh, sometimes in conflict with the objective indicators of the government performance. By the objective indicators, I mean two things. First is the crime rate or better murder rate, because murders are better registered uh, in uh, low-developed low countries. Uh, if there is a body, there is a case, so basically all the murders are registered except for the countries where there are uh, wars going on. And second, the share of the shadow economy. It's also an objective indicator. It is evaluated based on uh, certain procedures, the uh, share of cash money, the uh, 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 consumption of electricity, and so on. So there are estimates of the shadow economy. So uh, this is the uh, indicate, these are the indicators that allow you to see what kind of institutions do work. And one more thing, uh, central bank independence, because there was uh, one of the indicators of institutions in Sanjay's presentation was central bank independence. We know that central bank independence works to bring down inflation, but we know that low inflation is usually associated with less growth. So once we talk about economic growth, there is a paper by Alex Tuckerman which links the level of inflation to uh, the independence of the central bank. But uh, sometimes low inflation is not so good for growth and you know this inflation targeting which is a new mantra uh, today uh, uh, there are papers saying that there is a debate going on here so uh, central bank independence may not be such a uh, great uh, institution uh, for economic growth and, now, and quickly Valmy. Yes, and there are two questions from the gentleman in the middle of the room. Uh, uh, what about the uh, industrial policy, if the space for industrial policy is very much narrowed by the WTO and by the rule, by, so trade protection is, is out of question today and very difficult to exercise, and also intellectual property rights rule. The answer is, the simple answer is, uh, underpricing your exchange rate. Uh, I have a paper on that. Once you build your reserves and you underprice your exchange rate and build your reserves, then uh, it's an industrial policy that favors uh, traded goods versus non-traded goods and export-oriented development. This is the industrial policy of East Asian countries. By the way, in Africa, the country that proceeded with this kind of policy is Botswana, one of the most successful economies in Africa from 1960 to 2000. Uh, it was building the reserves, growing faster than any other country in the world, and the reserves to GDP ratio was the highest in the world, 24 months of imports, if I'm not mistaken. Now, uh, the second question was about... And very quickly, Vladimir. Yes, the uh, government failure and how it applies to Africa. Well, uh, in addition to Botswana, let me just point to the uh, other uh, story. Uh, there is a paper by Paul Terovich and your obedient servant, Stages of Development and Economic Growth. The increase in government spending was associated with a better performance, or at least the decline in government spending was associated with a worse performance. So there is some evidence for all the countries, not only for Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Okay, Sanjeev, now we're at risk of uh, crowding out the fund, but also crowding out lunch, so I'd ask you to be quite uh, succinct in your responses. That, that's okay. I'll, I'll stick with the, uh, the constraint that you've imposed. Um, uh, the, the one question which uh, I think two uh, uh, people asked was uh, about why is the result on the implementation stage on budget unity uh, so strange? Uh, it so happens that in seven countries, uh, you know, these, the way the decisions are being made, uh, the, we had seven countries in the sample f for, um, uh, for the low-income group. Uh, these, the central government expenditures were being authorized under one decision-making head. So this is an, an empirical artifact. It's not something which one can uh, explain through anything else. Uh, then there was this question about why is the business cycle uh, not included in the fiscal objectives? And the reason for that is in most of these uh, low-income countries, you do not have the ability to come up with a potential output 
and then have a structural deficit. So they normally rely on overall deficits and not have business cycles included in them. And that's one of the uh, reasons. And there was a question about uh, why there are, uh, um, about the independent fiscal agencies, what are they and how do they fit in with the role of the Ministry of Finance? To answer that question, one can look at the experience of the UK. Uh, UK did not have independent fiscal agency until recently, they set it up and uh, what it did was to improve the quality of the macro forecast that the Treasury was making. Until, uh, until then, the Treasury were overestimating the, the GDP growth. As a result, they were presenting a rosier picture uh, than it should have been, and, and that had a, a, an impact on, 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 on how the fiscal planning was being done. Now, as a part of the uh, reforms that have been introduced in Europe, all the countries are required to have independent fiscal agencies, so most of them are doing that. And finally, on the role of donors, uh, there is no specific institution uh, on the role of donors, uh, how the donors interface with the countries. Uh, the only thing one could do is in the fiscal reporting, the coverage of the accounts, the coverage of the money that is coming in from donors should be included in the, in the spending. Thank you very much, Sir Sanjeev, and it's good to know that um, England can do something right, um, given our success rate in football recently. Okay, so thank you very much to, for the panel. It's been an excellent session. Uh, we ran out of time for responses on the questions, but you can talk to them over lunch. To get your lunch, though, you'll need a name badge, so pick that up. And remember, at uh, 1.30, there is a launch of a book on international development, uh, speakers including David Malone, the rector of the United Nations University. David is in the audience there, uh, together with Ravi Kanbor, so do come along to that. It remains for me to thank the panel and to thank you for a very good session. Thank you. Thank you.